Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to Inizor Education. Um, today we'll continue talking about uh, Hilbert spaces. Uh, I'll just talk about a couple of examples of Hilbert spaces. Uh, this is lecture number nine um, in the chapter called Vectors, which is part of the course Mass Plus and Problems presented on Unizor.com. Uh, I suggest you to watch the lecture from the website. You go to Unizor.com, choose this course, Math Plus and Problems, choose the chapter called Vectors, and it will be number nine. Now, um, it's very important actually to watch it from the website because the website contains um, notes for each lecture, which basically is like part of the textbook dedicated to that particular. Um, lecture, whatever I'm discussing during that lecture. Um, so it's very convenient actually, you can watch the lecture or you can read the textbook basically piece for this particular material. Um, the website is totally free, no uh, ads, no sign-on is not necessary, I mean you can do it but that's for different purposes, so just use it at will. Okay, so um, I will just talk about two simple, relatively simple examples of um, uh, Hilbert space. Well, the first one was simplified actually, so it will not be a Hilbert space, it will be pre-Hilbert space. I'll talk about the details and a couple of problems related to this. Okay, so my first uh, example of a space which will be almost Hilbert space is um, consider all the polynomials called P of X polynomial on the segment zero one. So polynomial of any degree, so all the polynomials, whatever is basically, whatever exists in the world, um, with real values defined on the domain from 0 to 1, real numbers. Okay, now, first of all, let's talk about kind of qualities of this particular, characteristic of this particular domain, of this particular set, actually. Um, first of all, is there an operation of addition among different elements of this particular set? Well, yes, any uh, two elements can be added together, p of x plus uh, q of x, that will be just another polynomial, right? If you add 2x squared and uh, 3x plus 1, you add together, will be just another polynomial. So, the set of all polynomials uh, has an operation of addition, and it does not really go outside of this set. Two polynomials added together are um, polynomial. Now, how about our axioms, which we were postulated, postulating for the set to be equal to, to be actually a vector space? Well, if you remember, the first axiom was commutative. Now, commutative means this. Now, is this the right property of addition of two polynomials? Well, absolutely. If you add two polynomials, the sum doesn't really depend on which order. Is it 2x squared plus 3x plus 1, or is it 3x plus 1 plus x squared? It's exactly the same thing. So we have the commutative. Do we have associative? Can you do this? First these two, or you can do first these two. Obviously, it's the same thing. So, associative law is also there. 
Is there a zero polynomial which I can add to any other which will not change that other? Well, yes, the polynomial of which is uh, identically equal to zero at any point uh, from zero to one. So that's a function, function which is equal to zero at any point, at any argument. And obviously, uh, if you add it to any other polynomial, it will not change that polynomial. Okay, great. Now, is there an opposite to a polynomial? P of x plus minus p of x. Is there a minus p of x such that the sum is equal to zero polynomial? Yes, obviously. For a polynomial uh, 2x squared, it's minus 2x squared. For a polynomial 2x squared plus 3x plus 1, it's minus 2x squared minus 3x minus 1. If you will add them together, you will have a polynomial which is equal to 0 at any point. Okay, now how about multiplication by some real number? So we're talking about linear vector space, so we have to really multiply by um, by some constant. Okay, now um, first of all, is it commutative? Where alpha is just some real number. Yes, it is commutative. Okay. Uh, is it associative? So can you just multiply one and then another, or you multiply first two real numbers and then multiply? Again, obviously, for any um, polynomial, that's true. That basically is... Okay, now let's continue with multiplication. Um, multiplication by zero. This is number zero, which is different from the function, which is uh, equal to zero at any point. So that's why I have this x and this, uh, and here I don't have x. So multiplication by zero of any polynomial, you will get you will get zero polynomial, which is equal to everywhere to zero. Now, if you have multiplied by one, it will not change it. So I'm talking about all the axioms which we were talking before about Hilbert space. Now, uh, what else is uh, distributive law? Alpha plus beta multiplied by p of x, where alpha and beta are just two real numbers. You can do it separately. Alpha p of x plus beta of p of, t p of x. And the final distributive law versus sum of two polynomials. Um, alpha of p of x plus q of x. You multiply sum of two polynomials by number, or you can multiply separately and then add them together. The result will be the same. So these are all the accents which we were talking about. Um, these are linear vector uh, space. These are all axioms or linear vector space over the set of real numbers. So these coefficients, alpha, beta, 0, 1, they're all real numbers. We'll talk about complex numbers separately. So all these are satisfied. So it's a linear vector space. Now, to become a Hilbert space, we need one more, well, two more things. One is definitely a scalar uh, product. Okay, so what is a scalar product in that particular case? This is the most, the most significant part of this particular example. Because all the properties of linear space, linear vector space, which I was just talking about before, they are kind of obvious. They are immediately following from the properties of any polynomial, right? Now, how about the, uh, this uh, vector in scalar, scalar space? Okay, I have to define it somehow, which means from two polynomials, I have to multi uh, I have to somehow uh, define an operation called scalar product, which results in real number, right? We're talking about real 
uh, Hilbert space. Okay, here it is. Here is my definition. I will call it p of x times q of x. Now I put square brackets to basically differentiate from real multiplication of two polynomials. The multiplication of two polynomials we are not considering here at all. We are considering only their scalar product which is supposed to result in the real number. And for this I am multiplying them as real polynomial but then I integrate from 0 to 1. This is a definite integral and that was obviously considered part of the calculus um, uh, part of the uh, prerequisite course for this one which is called mass for teens by the way. So this is the definition of a scalar product. Now does this definition satisfy all the axioms which we were talking about. Okay. Now, property number one, scalar product of uh, an element by itself supposed to be always greater, of ze uh, uh, greater than zero for p of x not equal to zero of x. So if my polynomial is not zero on every point of this particular uh, segment, um, then uh, its uh, scalar product uh, with itself, which is basically integral of p square dx, it's a p square, it's supposed to be something positive because we are talking about non-null, uh, at, at, at all points of, of this interval. So integral is supposed to be positive. And it's equal to zero if p of x is equal to zero. So that's kind of obvious thing. If the function is zero, then this integral will be, integral, uh, will, will be zero. Okay, now, uh, what's next? Next is commutative. Commutative property of scalar product which is p of x q of x equals to q of x p of x. Now is it commutative? Well obviously it is because it means you are changing the order of multiplication of two polynomials and the order uh, and uh, the result doesn't really depend. It will be another polynomial but it doesn't really matter how you in what order you multiply. So the commutative of our scalar product is following from the commutative of the product of two polynomials because all we do after the product we just integrate. So if the functions under integra integral are the same then integral will be the same. Okay, now then uh, proportional um, for multiplication. If you multiply one polynomial by some real number and then use it in a scalar product that would be the same as if you multiply this um, uh, uh, multiplier, this factor by scalar product of that. So that's the proportionality of the scalar product of coefficient lambda. What's next? Next is distributive law. Okay, distributive law is p of x plus q of x if you multiply, uh, let me just parenthesis, if you multiply by r of x scalar, so that's integral of their product, that's the same as you have p of x r of x plus q of x. R of x. Now why is this true? Well again it follows from the distributive property for multiplication. Now if instead of this square brackets I will put integral which basically it is, uh, the whole uh, distributive law 
uh, for integral would be following from the distributive law for product of two polynomials. If you have two polynomials multiplied by third, so you add the first two and multiply by third, or you first multiply first by third and the second by third and then add together, the result will be the same. And that's why after integration it will be the same as well. So, that's it. So, these are properties of the scalar product which are satisfied. So, is our set of polynomials on a defined on the segment 0, 1 a Hilbert space? No, it's a pre-Hilbert space. If you remember, there is one more property which actually I will disregard right now for further, uh, but, but the property is completeness. Now, completeness means that every sequence of elements of a set should really, um, if, if, if it's converging to something, that something it converges to should also be part of the set. Now, is it true for polynomials? No. And let me just give you an example. Um, uh, again, from the course of calculus, you remember there is a Taylor um, series which um, can approximate basically any differentiable function to any uh, degree of precision. So, um, the Taylor series is a polynomial basically, if you will cut it on any kind of a uh, number of members. And the more members you will add into this series, the closer it will be to some function, which is supposed to be differentiable sufficient number of times. Um, but the function can be anything, like I don't know, 2 to the power of x, that's a function which is not a polynomial. But you can, you can approximate it using series, like a Taylor series, for example, uh, uh, of polynomials. So not every sequence of polynomials which converges to something um, uh, results in uh, that something, the limit, to be part of the would be polynomial. So set of polynomials which is converging might converge into a non-polynomial function. That what makes this uh, space not a Hilbert space but pre-Hilbert space. However, the um, many important properties of Hilbert space are actually properties of the pre-Hilbert space as well. For example, um, a, a, an inequality of uh, cauchy schwarz bunyakovsky right? So basically right now what I'm going to do, I will demonstrate this um, inequality uh, of uh, cauchy schwarz bunyakovsky I will demonstrate it in this particular case when I have a um, set of polynomials as an example of pre-Hilbert space. So as an example, let's just take two polynomials, x to the power of m and x to the power of n. And I will use the um, uh, Cauchy uh, schwarz bunyakovsky inequality for these two polynomials, which are a member of this um, uh, pre-Hilbert space, right? So, um, what is the uh, uh, inequality Cauchy uh, schwarz in this particular case? Well, it says norm of xm times xn uh, square square, right, um, should be less than equal to norm of x square and norm of, I mean, x to the n square, m square. And x to the n square. Where norm, basically, um, is norm of any p of x, this is square. This is p of x times p of x square brackets here. Now, I did uh, basically mention that this is basically another word for a square root of uh, a scalar product uh, by itself. It's supposed to be positive. If it's not, uh, if it's not zero, that's why I put it 
square. So basically, norm is a square root of this. OK, now, let's talk about it. So what is integral of x to the m, x to the n dx from 0 to 1? So that's what basically my um, scalar product of these two. Well, this is x to the power of m plus n. So that's uh, x to the power of f plus n plus 1 divided by m plus n plus 1 from 0 to 1. If you put, uh, uh, substitute 1, it would be 1 over m plus n plus 1. Um, and if you will mod minus uh, 0, it would be 0. OK. Now, on the right side, I will have, obviously, uh, integral of x to the power of m, that would be x to the power of m plus 1 divided by m plus 1 from 0 to 1. And for n, it would be x to the n plus 1 divided by n plus 1, 0, uh, 1 to 0. So this one is equal to 1 over m plus 1. This one is equal to 0, n plus 1. So what is this particular inequality when I have all the values. Well, this inequality says that 1 over m plus n plus 1 square should be less than or equal to m plus 1 square times n plus 1 square. Now, this is something which is basically an inequality of cauchy schwarz bunyakovsky Now, it's not exactly obvious that this is a true uh, inequality, um, but that follows from uh, the theory of um, operators and scalar product in the abstract uh, vector space. So it's supposed to be true. Now, just to make sure that this is true, let's just try to prove it differently. Now, uh, these are um, uh, fractions. So if, if I will invert the fractions, I'm supposed to get the opposite side, right? So instead of proving this one, I will prove this one. Greater or equal m plus 1 square n plus 1 square, right? Oh, no, 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 I, I, I made a mistake. It's not x plus 1. Um, sorry. Norm of x to the m is integral of x to the m times x to the m. So it's 2m plus 1. Same thing, square. Same thing with n. So instead of this, I have to put 2m plus 1. My mistake. So square goes to uh, under integral, um, integral of x to the n times x to the n, it's x to the 2n integral, so it would be 2n plus 1. Am I right? I think now I'm right. Let me check my notes. Yes. So instead of um, proving this one, I will invert both and I will have m plus n plus 1 square should be greater or equal to m plus 1 to n plus 1. Okay, let's open all the parentheses. Would be m square n square 1 square plus 2mn plus 2m plus 2n. That's this one square. On this side it would be greater or equal 4mn plus 2n plus 2n plus 1, right? Okay, now 1 
and 2m and 2n, 1, 2n, 2n, 4mn goes to the left and I will have m squared plus n squared minus 2mn should be greater or equal to 0. And this is obvious because this is m minus n squared. That's greater or equal to 0. So we kind of proven this particular inequality. But it, it's just for out, out of curiosity, because real, really the inequality follows from something which we have proven before, the Cauchy um, inequality. All right, so that's basically it for the theory. And I wanted to make a couple of uh, problems, uh, solve a couple of problems related to this. Now, first problem is, Uh, first problem is is um, consider sequence of infinite um, uh, infinite sequence of real numbers, and the only property is that some of their squares some of their squares. from n is equal to 1 to infinity is converging. So it's limited, basically. So whenever we are uh, adding squares of these numbers together up to infinity, we will still have some real number. Like, for example, if it's a geometric progression, sum of infinite geometric progression is a real number. It's not infinite. So we're talking about all the sequences of infinite sequences of real numbers which have this pro particular property. So my uh, statement is that this is basically equivalent to n-dimensional um, Euclidean space, but the uh, difference is that n-dimensional has only a uh, limited number. If it's like three-dimensional, it's three numbers. If it's n-dimensional, it's n numbers. This is infinite dimensional so to speak, equivalent of n-dimensional uh, Euclidean space. And I will define everything is exactly the same way as, the same way as in um, n-dimensional real uh, Euclidean space, which means sum of two sequences would be correspondingly sum of element by element. So multiplication by constant would be again multiplication by uh, all elements by the same constants. And uh, because I have this particular restriction, then sum and multiplication by a number would also be um, uh, limited. It will be non-infinite sum. It will be some kind of a converging number. Uh, now, it's converging because it's square, so it's, which means we are always increasing with the next component, but up to a certain limit. The sum would be um, limited and uh, converges to some number. So this is basically a vector space in the same rights as the uh, n-dimensional Euclidean space. So the only difference is n-dimensional Euclidean space has n um, uh, components, uh, and this one has infinite number of components, infinite sequence. Doesn't matter, Mike, but, it, but what's important is that, uh, again, how do we define scalar product? Again, if you remember, if you have two um, uh, sequences in n-dimensional uh, space, you multiply each one by each one and sum them together, right? So their scalar product would be sum of the products. How about here? Can we do the same thing? Yes, we can. Because obviously, uh, since xn times yn would be less than or equal to half of xn squared plus yn squared. That's obvious. This is 
because if you multiply by 2 and put everything to one side, it would be xn minus yn square, right? So that's obvious inequality. That's why, since this is converging, if you, if you get the sum, and you get the sum here, this is converging and this is converging because I put it as a condition. So this one is converging as well. So a scalar product is defined. There is a result, real number, which is uh, the sum of uh, multiplication of comp by component multiplication. Okay, so um, it's uh, basically defined, and it has all the properties which we have, which we have checked for um, in, in all the previous cases. And these properties were checked for in mention and dimensional um, Euclidean space. So everything seems to be fine. Okay. And so this is another example of a Hilbert space. So these infinite sequences present actually another example of Hilbert space. In this case, it's a real Hilbert space because um, if you have certain sequence of um, uh, elements of this space uh, and they will converge to something, then their limit will also converge. This is not an easy theorem. I'm not. Um, uh, proving it here um, and it's not really very important for our further um, uh, material but that's true so this is particular example of a true complete uh, Hilbert space not just pre-Hilbert space so pre-Hilbert space properties are obvious uh, to add this convergence that would be probably a little bit more difficult but it's true okay now are there kind of natural, if you wish, um, spaces which are not really Hilbert spaces? And uh, this is the subject of my very simple problem. What if you have two-dimensional vectors? So just real, non real ve vectors in two-dimensional space. But if you have two vectors, x1, x2, and y1, y2. Now, how to define their scalar product? Now, the normal scalar, scalar product is x1 times y, y1 plus x2 times y2, right? Th this is a normal scalar product. What I would like to do is define it differently. So not only x1, y1, plus x2, y2, I would like to add some kind of a cross product. Would that be a scalar product in, 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 in the sense of Hilbert space? Well, the answer is no. Why? Because I can always find a vector whose norm some kind of an element, a pair of numbers, whose norm would be equal to zero, but some vector is not equal to zero, zero. So that's, that's my, basically, conclusion, that I can find a vector which is not zero, not zero, zero, in this case it's two component, but its norm, which is square root of the scalar product by itself, A times A scalar product. So the square root of this would be equal to zero. Now, how can I find it? Well, here is how I did it. Let me just fix one particular component. Let's say the second component. So I will take this vector where x is unknown. And I will try to scalar product it by itself using this particular. So this is my x1, this is my x2. This is my x1. Well, this is now y1, actually, because it's the same vector, but it's y1 and y2. 
Okay. So I will form scalar product because of this, using this formula. x1 times y1, that's x squared, plus 2x times 1, so it's x, plus 1 times x, 2, 1 say x, and plus um, x to y2, 1. Now, I would like it to be equal to 0. I would like to find x, which will give me the 0. So this would be, instead of 2x, I will put 4x. And I just have to solve this quadratic equation. Does it have a non-zero result? Does it have any roots? Well, yes, it does. It's minus 2 plus minus square root of 4 minus 1, so it's 3. Okay, so I have even two. So each one of them, let's say this one with a plus, comma one, this pair of uh, coordinates, so my two-dimensional vector, this vector, if I will uh, multiply it, scalar it, multiply it by itself according to this formula, I will have zero, which means non-zero vector has norm which is equal to zero magnitude norm magnitude same thing um, which is basically a contradiction with uh, rules of Hilbert space so that's not possible that's it so not every kind of a normally defined kind of reasonably defined scalar product result is result in Hilbert space Okay, and the last thing which I would like to do is to prove the parallelogram theorem, which is this. So let me just explain it in two-dimensional case. If you have a parallelogram, this is vector A and this is vector B on a two-dimensional um, uh, plane. Now, A plus B would be this one, right? If you will take A, attach to the end of B, you will get this. So this would be A plus B. And this would be A minus B. So what this says is, sorry, have to put this. Sum of squares of diagonals is equal to sum of squares of all four sides. Two of them are A, two of them are B, that's why it's sum of all the sides. Is it true? Well, first of all, it's a nice um, geometrical problem. You can just prove it relatively easily, and they put a hint uh, into um, the textual description of uh, this lecture. So if you will go to unisor.com, you will find a hint, and I suggest you to basically solve it yourself, this problem. But I will use properties of uh, abstract vector space with uh, scalar product defined. Uh, so it's purely linear algebra. So how can I prove it? Okay, what's the uh, norm of the vector uh, square? That's the product of vector by itself, right? So it's a minus b um, uh, scalar product with a minus b. That's what it is. Now this is corresponding with a plus b scalar product with a plus b, which is equal to now. A scalar product has associative, commutative properties, etc., etc. So I can basically multiply a times a, which is what? Which is a square, right? Which is norm of a square. Scalar product of a times a, it, it, it's a, a, a square of uh, its norm. Minus 2ba, so it's minus uh, ba and ab. So commutative properties, so I put this, a times b, right? And plus norm of b. Now here I will have plus, again I will have norm of a square 
now it will be plus 2ab plus b squared. Now this cancels this, if you were them together, and you will have two a's and two b's, which is very simple. So I'm using commutative and associative properties of scalar product. And that completes this lecture about examples of different um, spaces with uh, properties of uh, um, whatever the properties we need for Hilbert space. Um, I do suggest you to read the notes for this lecture. They basically contain exactly the same material. Um, uh, and uh, these couple of problems, think about themselves. Uh, th think about these problems just by themselves. Uh, try to solve them somehow differently than whatever I just suggested. Um, and especially the uh, geometric proof of the same law, uh, law of parallelogram when square, sum of squares of diagonals is equal to sum of squares of all four sides. So these are all useful exercises and I do suggest you to do it. It's all on unisol.com. Go to the course Mass Plus and Problems. Choose the um, chapter Vectors and this is vector number 09. Okay, that's it for today. Thank you very much and good luck. <laughs>